<coughs> Your Excellencies, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, I think as we're talking about a coronation, we can afford to be a little formal, uh, uh, but it will cease at that point. It's also, Ambassador, um, delightful that you really anticipated my introduction because you know, I'm a creature, um, that wonderful denigrating phrase, television historian, the sneer which the academic inflict upon you. I remember once when the even worse term was flung at me, popular historian, to which I responded, I suppose it's better than being an unpopular historian. Anyway, uh, being a television historian, can I remind you of the splendid visual aids which Jorg has put behind us? You have on this side the crowned republic of Hungary, and you have on that side the royal arms, and I make no apology of using the term, of the crowned republic of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. We are, have been, and if we survive, always will be a republic. But it's a republic under a crown. Now the fate of the crown of England has been very different. The great paradox is, it is a profound paradox, that Hungary with a history of permanent impermanence, permanent turbulence, forever different never the same, three or four coronation sites, innumerable dynasties and non-dynasties, failures of royal line, usurpations and whatever, in contrast with Britain, with this England in particular. Remember, Britain is simply England with additions. It is very, very important. It is very important that one understands this basic fact. And one addition is nearly catastrophic, which is that of Scotland. I will talk about, I will, I will talk about that later, uh, very much later, of course, but, but I will talk about it. Um, um, the the uh, England, in contrast, of fixed frontier, of fixed constitution, largely. We have been a parliamentary monarchy since the 13th century, undoubtedly, of fixed coronation site, of fixed coronation order. I can go on. Nevertheless, destroying everything of royal antiquity. When Charles is crowned, it will be with factitious invented instruments. There is not a single thing that goes behind 1660. There are myths, and they are pure myths. They're 19th century myths of Stuart Rubies, of Prince of Wales, sorry, Stuart Sapphire's Prince of Wales Rubies, of the Coronation Spoon. The coronation spoon is 12th century. There isn't a shred of evidence it was ever used before 1660. So there's the paradox of a country of extraordinary stability, which destroyed every single symbol of monarchy, and one of profound instability, which has preserved that crown. And if it hadn't have been for the Republicans burying the lot in the 19, uh, in, 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 in the, uh, after the fall of the Republic um, in, in, in the 19th century, uh, you would have preserved huge amounts of the actual fabric of the gloves, um, the, the, well, the, royal, the, the, the royal robe uh, do, does survive, huge amounts of other things. So this extraordinary contrast. What I want now to do is to explore, and again, I am ignorant about Hungarian history, it would be impertinent for me to pretend to do anything more than comment in terms of generality. What I'm hoping to do is to throw out sufficient ideas, beginning with this introduction, that can be picked up by those who are interested in the questions for which we've got a proper half hour. What I'm wanting to do in this first section here is to establish with, in terms of that dialogue, between consecration versus um, contract, I'm wanting to establish the authenticity of my idea of the English Royal Republic. The term is, of course, those of you who are familiar with Walter Badgett uh, in, the, uh, in his uh, um, uh, uh, English Constitution, the, the book, remember, to understand it, you have to understand Badgett writes just before 1867. 
Bill and I were talking about the importance of 1867, the broadening of the franchise from, as it were, the educated to the ordinary working man, carried out, of course, like most important constitutional changes, or at least good ones, by the Conservative Party. Um, the, 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 the Badgett writes just before that, and he writes with the terror of a genuine liberal at the thought of popular government. But he actually uses the term in that, a royal republic. And he says, a republic has enfolded itself beneath the robes of monarchy. But this idea goes back so much further. One of the most interesting presages of the idea is actually John Adams, the founding father of the United States, or one of the greatest of the founding fathers, in 1760. 1760s, you know, a, cent, uh, a decade before the movement of independence gets underway, he writes in formal terms that England is a republic. The constitution of England is a republic. That is to say, the monarch is under the laws. There are known judicial procedures and so on. To, in all important senses, it is a republic. The idea that you have somebody who's called a king as head of a republic is no problem. The idea of a republic relates to the fixidity of a constitution and the supremacy of legal arrangements, as opposed to merely the arbitrary will of the ruler. This idea goes back further, I mean, and again, Adams is just picking it up from the main tradition of English constitutional law. If you go back to my own period of the 16th century, the most important statement of this idea actually puts the term republic in the title. The, uh, the De Republica Anglorum, uh, which is written in the 1560s by Sir Thomas Smith, um, Secretary of State and previously a Latin secretary, and um, he actually takes the title from Cicero, um, uh, his lost work, largely lost work, the De Republica, but also from, from, from Contarini, Cardinal Contarini's De Republica Venetorum, on the account of the Venetian Republic, which again has a quasi-monarchical figure at its head, the Doge. And from that point, it stretches way, way, way back into the Middle Ages. How does this happen? How does it come about? How do we register it? How do we make it from simply a use of language, republic? How do we anchor it into actual political practice? Let's then go back. It's always a very good idea. If one's a historian, one should go back. Um, one should go back, preferably if one is a good historian, to the beginning. Now, I'm not going to go back to the beginning of English history because we have only an hour and we've already got through 17 minutes of it. I will endeavour, I'll endeavour again with the t training of television uh, to keep roughly to time. Um, I will go back to what is our convenient starting point, which is the coronation, the coronation of King Edgar in 973. Now, there's a double reason for taking this because the Ordo, that's to say the coronation ritual of Edgar, is plausibly, and I'm not going to use anything stronger than the word plausibly, the source of the Hungarian coronation ritual. So we have a kind of common starting point. We have two. We've got the common starting point, which is really a finishing point of the idea of a royal republic. We also have the common starting point of the Ordo, the actual thing. Let's have a look at it. This he, he is the great grandson of Alfred, our only king who bears the title great. And his coronation is almost certainly a second coronation. And he's really being crowned not simply as king of England, though he is the first actually to issue um, a coinage with the formal title on it of Rex Anglorum king of the English. And where there are, there are English, there is an England. At least that used to be the case. It, it's clearly rapidly changing, but there we are. Um, <laughs> um, so he's Rex Anglorum, but he is also in effect, and this is another important idea that we will play with, because the Hungarian crown and the British St. Edward's crown are both arched crowns. They are imperial crowns. And this first coronation in our history in 973 is an imperial coronation. It's a coronation, again, with um, a saint figure. Uh, your first 
coronation is, of course, of a royal saint. We have a royal saint, whom I'll come to in a moment, but at this point it's St Dunstan, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is one of the great uh, precursors, in, well, the, 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 the great pi precursors, wrong word, pioneers in England of, of, of the, the Benedictine monastic revival, and he is the, the, the man who crowns, uh, crowns Edgar and is almost certainly responsible for the coronation order itself. Two things about it. The first is place. It takes place, of all things, in Bath. And it takes place in Bath because Bath is both the site of one of these important new Benedictine abbeys, St Dunstan that I'm talking about, but it also harks back to something earlier. It would then have been the site of the largest surviving Roman ruins in Britain. The baths in Bath probably still had something of the great arched, think of the baths of Caracalla, the great arched roof, the structures that, that mesmerise the Anglo-Saxons. Remember, uh, the, the natural British building material is wattle and daub and thatch. You, know. you think of our fascination with romanticism. Uh, we come to classicism rather late. And, and, uh, but the, you have this extraordinary juxtaposition of the magnificence of Rome and everything that that represented. And of course, a church. Remember, the great decision of the Anglo-Saxon monarchy is that, again, it is the same as the Hungarian monarchy, that its religion will be Rome. It is precisely that same decision which, again, characterizes St. Stephen, though, of course, St. Stephen is a choice um, between uh, uh, Byzantium, uh, uh, between Orthodoxy and Catholicism. Here, it's a choice between Celtic religion, the Synod of Whitby, the, the, the Celtic religion, and that of Rome. So he is crowned by um, a great monastic revivalist, and he's crowned according to a, the, the great Ordo. And the, the, the elements of the, the similarity of the ceremony, we saw the tape there of the coronation of the Queen. I was one of those who first saw it. I watched it as a boy of eight, first time I'd seen television, all dressed up in my best suit with my mother in a furious temper because we were watching it on next door's television. And as she put on her very best, rather tight um, uh, uh, grey suit, as we walked into the house, she said, pointing at the television, I expect it's a fruit of immoral earnings. But there we are. <laughs> <laughs> my mother is very important in my life. Anyway, um, I remember, I can still remember the extraordinary scene there um, and the, 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 the way in which it's anticipated by so much uh, in the coronation of 973. The coronation of 973 began in exactly the same way that this one of 53 and maybe this one of uh, 2023 will by swearing an oath. The oath is different. The oath is to keep the peace to church and people, to repress rapacity and iniquity, and to do justice in mercy and in truth, which is exactly the oath that the kings of Hungary swore also. So there it is. And then follows, uh, after that has been done, follows anointing at which the anthem Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king was sung, except, of course, the music was not by hand. But that is, that's the key difference. So you have, but that coronation, as I said, was an imperial one. It's followed immediately by an extraordinary symbolic rowing of the king on the River Dee, in which those doing the rowing are an assortment of Celtic kinglets. It's such a pity that Sturgeon has resigned. I would have loved, I would, I would have loved to see her performing the same service. So uh, there we are. Now, how do we get from that Anglo-Saxon ceremony held in Bath? And thereafter, moving around, why we've got so many Kingstons in the country is that they were all, at various points, royal coronation sites. Um, but basically, in the Anglo-Saxon monarchy settling down at Winchester, how come the shift to this fundamental point of Westminster? Why does it happen? How does it happen? Well, it happens because, again, at another one of these extraordinary points of intersection between British and Hungarian history. May I use the word conquest? 
Hungary is a repeatedly conquered place. 1526, the uh, double fate of the Second World War, arguably <coughs> the Habsburgs. We were conquered more radically and absolutely in 1066. And this fact needs to be understood. Your conquests left a more powerful sense of separateness and identity. Ours did something infinitely radical and fused a language. We are a product of a double root, the root of French and English. English is an artificial language invented at the, by Geoffrey Chaucer essentially at the end of the 14th century. It is unique in this regard. It's why, of course, it is uniquely suitable for our multilingual world because it is itself a linguistic fusion. You cannot have an academy, academy in English. You can't talk about pure English to coin a French phrase, ça n'existe pas. Um, it, 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 there cannot be a pure English. We are, we are a product of fusion. So the, the, the impact of the Norman conquest, infinitely radical. It's a conquest that becomes so absolute that being English as the first great English historian, the ambassador was kind enough to refer to me as a very junior one, the first really great English historian, William of Malmesbury, who was himself of Anglo-Saxon stock, says that to be English was to be a badge of shame. You were a conquered and suppressed people subject to an effectively terrorist law. What then happens is that the Norman conquerors progressively compromise, progressively pull back from that um, effective obliteration of the Anglo-Saxon past. And the first way you do it is by the sanctification of the last, again, holy kings, the sanctification of the last Anglo-Saxon king, King Edward, Edward the Confessor, St. Edward. And he becomes, uh, William the Conqueror, if you look again, we have that extraordinary grand testament of all of this, uh, which of course is in France. I mean, dear me, when we're talking about repossessing historically important artifacts, I am prepared to swap the Elgin marbles for the Bayeux tapestry. And maybe, maybe Monsieur Macron, with his fondness for negotiating the unnegotiable, uh, which he tests repeatedly with his own people, might actually send himself to do that. But the, 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 if you actually look look at the structure of the bio tapestry it is designed to present William the Conqueror as the legitimate heir of Edward and uh, uh, Harold the last Anglo-Saxon king as an illegitimate usurper that's the entire purpose of the thing and the result is that you get in interpolating itself into the coronation idea and eventually into the coronation oath, the idea of that there's a golden Anglo-Saxon age, systems of law which somehow, somewhere mysteriously survive under the overlay of the Norman conquest. And that is, I think, the foundation idea of so much that we're going to be talking about, this idea that there is somewhere a foundation of law which is independent of the will of the conqueror. But it is vague, it is merely elusive, it is there bluntly, as so much in English history, as a veil of decency thrown over brutality. Remember, that idea of a veil of decency, a drapery, is common both to Edmund Burke and, interestingly enough, to Karl Marx. The idea of the decency of language that you throw over, over the horror uh, of, 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 of reality. Uh, but the element of reality is place. William the Conqueror is crowned for the first time of anybody at Westminster. The church that was built by Edward the Confessor, the new church, the West Church, that's built uh, um, uh, to the west of London on the slightly higher land, uh, uh, on the foreshore of the Thames, um, and already Edward, Edward the Confessor is buried there. So William is actually crowned in front of the tomb of the Confessor in the Abbey. This assimilation back to Anglo-Saxon England, this, this softening of the edges of conquest, 
continues from this point onwards. The younger son, the, the youngest son of the conqueror to succeed, Henry I, deliberately marries back into the Anglo-Saxon royal line. He deliberately marries um, a Scottish princess who, who, whose, whose parentage is half Anglo-Saxon. Uh, he he uh, emphasises much more than uh, than 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 the conqueror had done this 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 kind of of subterranean sense of 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 of, of a legal background or whatever. And by the way, it is very important that that that, that I stress the intense. We we tend to think of uh, the Norman conquest at its worst as a kind of rather violent version of a year in Provence. Um, uh, it, re it really, really is not. And it's also very important to understand why the Normans are so keen to conquer England, because England was rich and Normandy wasn't. One has to understand Anglo-Saxon England had the world's most sophisticated, and I use that word deliberately, world's most sophisticated system of coinage. Edgar sets up a system of recoinage king I've been talking about, sets up a system of recoinage in which I think it's, it varies. Either every five or every seven years, there is a complete recall of the coinage so that it can be reminted according to approved fineness. And the, 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 the Normans have never seen quantities of gold such as they seized in England. William the Conqueror's first Christmas back in Normandy, these vast treasures, the loot of Anglia. So, and again, a profoundly tensile structure of government with the county being both a seat of local government, but also as really rather like a kind of cell within the structure of communism, sending representatives up. And it's this, du this double frame of Anglo-Saxon government, which, which Henry I brilliantly exploits. If we can leap forward a little bit, I'm afraid, we have to jump centuries a lot. This, this notion of the Anglo-Saxon origins becomes profoundly developed after the great rupture of Magna Carta at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the 13th century, the, the, the rupture of 1215, uh, by John's son, the only person strikingly not to be crowned at Westminster, Henry III, as an infant crowned at, uh, at Gloucester, because at that point, London, at Westminster, the royal regalia, all held by the French invaders. This is the moment at which England is very nearly conquered by France because the Magna Carta lords invite in uh, King Louis, Louis the Lion of France, or no, sorry, Prince Louis, Prince Louis the Lion of France um, to, 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 to defeat both John uh, and, and hopefully uh, to remove his infant son, Henry III. But Henry III is crowned. He survives thanks to the extraordinary genius of William the Marshal, uh, the... Uh, the, the Later on, he would have been called Lord Protector. He's then just called um, Regent, and the uh, and the papal and the papal legate. Again, another figure that plays a major part in Hungarian history. Uh, our papal legate, Guala, um, uh, and. Um, the uh, what what uh, Henry the Third does is deliberately to re-Anglo-Saxonize the monarchy. He names his gives his sons. Anglo-Saxon names. Do we realise Edward is a Edward? It's Anglo-Saxon. Edmund is a Edmund. And he rebuilds Westminster Abbey. He'd thought at first that he would actually make it the Church of the Temple. He thought he would make his coronation church the Church of the Temple, which is why there is, if those of you who have not seen it, the magnificent round church in the temple, uh, uh, you know, which is now the end of course. Go and look at it, it's wonderful. And he thought that might do. And then he has this, this extraordinary inspired view. He will create something which I think is actually unique in European history. That is to say, a church that will be simultaneously the place where the king is crowned, where the founder saint of the dynasty will lie, and where the monarchs will be buried. This extraordinary triple invocation of the sacredness of monarchy and the church that we will see the the abbey that we will see very shortly is specifically built for the purpose of coronation at the heart of the church uh, in this enormously extended choir there lies the shrine of the confessor then arrayed round it on elevated plinths there are the tombs of all his successors that was how the church was envisaged to work. And then in front of it, 
there is the hugely expanded area of the crossing, which is actually labelled the Coronation Theatre. It's a theatre. And we now only can glimpse its splendour originally. The, again, the, there's been quite a lot of publicity about the amazing floor, the pavement, which is by all the, the main structure of the church is French Gothic. And by the way, we think of, of our ancestors not having a sense of stylistic appropriateness. The, the west front of the abbey is only finished in the reign of Henry VIII. And it is deliberately built in the same style, finished off by the wonderful uh, uh, Abbot Islip. And then the towers are not added until the end of the 17th century, deliberately in the same style. Right. So you this, but but so it's French Gothic. But the area around the royal tombs and the area uh, of the theatre is Italian. Again, Rome. And it's with the most magnificent detailing conceivable. The Cosmati pavement survives. That's a pavement made out of precious stones, including particularly porphyry, in extraordinary swirling patterns. And it's being exposed for the coronation for the first time for a very long time, indeed, in a fully restored state. But we can only glimpse of what it looked like be oh God, because, the actual, uh, because the actual lower walls of the columns were also gold mosaic. The, in other words, you must you, you 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 really need to have a sense of it. You need to go to Sicily, or uh, indeed, uh, what is the rather wonderful restaurant in Piccadilly uh, that has got the 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 the, the, the Decos Moriale? It's gone out of my the Criterion. Yeah, the go to the Criterion in London if you want a sense. It's gold mosaic, uh, or or indeed Ravenna. It's, it's an area of gold, all destroyed, of course, uh, once that area becomes open to the public after, after, after the Reformation. So there's this conscious invocation of St. Edward. And the point that, again, it's worth making, and this is where we connect to the crown of Hungary and this idea of consecration, you are consecrated not simply with the oils of unction, the multiple anointing. Um, quite how this is going to be done if Charles wears uniform, I have no idea. Do you know how many times an English sovereign has to be anointed? Palms of the hand, crown of the head, shoulder blades, breasts, and there and there. How you do that in tight uniform is beyond me, but uh, uh, the king clearly knows better. Anyway, there is the anointing there, but above all, what happened in the coronation, certainly from Henry III onwards, is you actually use the funeral regalia of Edward the Confessor. So you use Edward the Confessor's crown, his robes, his buskins, his sandals, the lot. So the, the, the saint literally touches himself upon you. We, we don't have the reaction of earlier medieval kings. We do of Charles I. We know Charles I was so keen to get himself inside the royal buskins that he actually shoves his feet in with the shoes on and tears them um, and is the only one actually to use the, the sacred Anglo-Saxon comb to comb, of course he's much more hair than most kings, to comb his hair after the sticky oil of unction has been put upon it. But there is this literal sense of the handing over. Now, so there is coronation. There is the sense of the, pass the, the passing down of antiquity, the revival of antiquity, all of those things. Where does then the idea of contract come in? Uh, because clearly, consecration doesn't have very much to do with republicanism. Where does the idea of contract come from? Well, the idea of contract fundamentally comes from the extraordinary, again, uh, series of events to which Henry III is reacting. That's to say Magna Carta, very similar in many ways to your golden bull. Uh, that's to say, uh, and essentially in, 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 in terms of 1215, an agree agreement forced upon, unlike the golden bull, forced upon a reluctant king by a rebellious nobility, which is designed to procure their special privileges and which also contains a clause which we have long forgotten in England which effectively turned England not into a royal republic but what Hungary 
sort of becomes and what Poland absolutely became a noble republic. Clause 61 of Magna Carta, which we have very carefully forgotten, sets up a committee of public safety consisting of 25 barons. It declares that everybody shall swear an oath not to the king, but to the 25 barons, that everything that the king was accused of doing shall be decided by the 25 barons, who will sit as judge, jury, and enforcers in their own cause, and that the 25 barons shall have the right to levy war upon the king, sparing only his person, that of his children, and that of his queen. Now, where English history and Hungarian history violently differ is that the Magna Carta of 1215 lasts barely three months. Our commemorations of it are totally inappropriate. The Magna Carta of 1215 happily is suppressed and is replaced, I already referred to William the Marshal, by a brilliant and characteristically English version in which it's the Royalist Charter of 1216 that survives and it's so very English. It preserves all the good bits of the Charter, like the right to justice, beginning to sort out the processes of taxation, all that sort of thing, but carefully removes the Republican clauses but does it in a fashion which is so English. Toby will love this. It sets up a committee. <laughs> and it labels all the eliminated clauses as being specially difficult and worthy of mature consideration. Literally, I'm quoting the Latin, and worthy of mature consideration. And they are carefully buried in the committee. And then there is this, again, we get Magna Carta wrong because Magna Carta is not an event, it is a process. And the process, the main process lasts 10 years. The final reissue of Magna Carta uh, in, the 50, in, in the 1220s um, uh, is, is, is overseen by the Archbishop who'd helped to, to draft it and had lost reputation in so doing. And that reissue of the 1220s is radically different and it is the testimony to the fact that English and Hungarian history are going to follow very different courses. Because what the Charter does, the, the, that, that reissue, of the early 1220s does, it is in the name of everybody, not the nobility. And the charter is granted to Henry, Henry III, in return for a universal grant of taxation. So you establish the principle of the redress of grievance in return for taxation. And that is, I think, the real foundation of what then develops rapidly in the, uh, in the, tw in the, third, in the 13th century, the idea of a, some form of representative assembly, of church, of nobles, and of greater gentry, and of townsmen, which we call a parliament. And the, the, under, the underpinning of all the ideas that I will be talking about of republic uh, in, in England is that idea that there is a body that represents everybody and that binds everybody. In the, I'm now quoting the words of the judges of the next century, of the 14th century judges, which binds everybody because everybody is there represented either in their own person the peers, the bishops, or by their representatives, the members of, 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 of the lower house. And it's, that, it's the creation of that body which is the enormous and peculiar feature of English history. Now, anybody who knows anything about European history at this point will say, Starkey is talking rubbish. Virtually every country had some form of estates. What is the difference? between the English estates and the estates of Hungary, the estates of France, the estates of virtually wherever. The difference is, and if only the Supreme Court had understood this, it would have not made the scandalous or erroneous judgment that it did uh, in terms of prorogation. The Supreme Court gave the parody of the English Parliament, that the par or the British Parliament, that Parliament exists to hold the government to account. In other words, to be a nuisance. This, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, is why parliaments disappeared virtually everywhere in Europe, because they got in the way of good government. That's why they go. The peculiarity about the English parliament is it is developed by strong kings, not weak kings. 
it becomes an instrument of government and Parliament then, as Parliament now, which is what Boris was actually doing, or rather Dominic Cummings was doing rather effectively, Parliaments have to be managed. You saw the catastrophe of an unmanaged parliament under Theresa May with, with John Burko and Dominic, and, and Dominic Grieve. I mean, that is what happens. Or indeed, the parliament of the Civil War, the, the, the Long Parliament or the Rump Parliament. An assembly, or indeed the Scottish Parliament, an assembly by itself cannot rule. It has to be managed. And the peculiarity then of the English Parliament is it becomes a regular part. Do you know we have more parliaments in the Middle Ages than we do now? You had a parliamentary election usually twice a year in times of war. It's, it is extraordinary. It's the machinery for raising taxation and the machinery for changing law by consent. Now, what this does, of course, it means that alongside this notion of the crown, there is another notion of the realm. It is the idea of the community of the realm. And the great struggles of English history, then, are not between a ruler and an estates, as, as it were, for, uh, led by a Count Palatine or whatever, as opposing forces clashing each other. They are within the same structure of government. That's the way one's got to understand it. And the first clash takes place, and it's the one, I think, which again sets up the whole machinery that I'm talking about. It begins barely a, a less than a century after Magna Carta uh, with the accession of Edward, again, E. Edward, Edward II, the son of the, the great warrior king, Edward I, the Malleus Scotorum, still on his tomb. How long that's going to survive there, you know, um, uh, yeah, d down there. Um, uh, 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 um, he, he uh, uh, still in the abbey, there is the hammer of the Scots there, and, and the, you know, he, that, that's why the, the Stoon of Schoon, or, or is it the Schoon of Stoon? I never know which round, yes. and it doesn't really matter uh, uh, why, why, why it will be put under the specially uh, made coronation chair. Anyway, his son is, is the reprobate Edward II and when he comes to the throne he's already got a very dubious relationship with Piers Gaveston who is actually given the task of carrying the crown at the coronation and all the rest of it and is, and is a rather disapproving chronicler of, of St Paul says you know the filthy hands of the favourite upon the crown. Gays were no popular more popular then than they were when I was a young man but never mind uh, in that sense times have changed a little for the better. Um, but the uh, but Edward then, when he comes to the throne in 1308, um, there is an immediate realisation there will be problems. And what again is the striking difference? In Hungary, if I understand it correctly, that tripartite traditional coronation oath is simply treated as a matter of form. What happens in England, we are so literal minded, you know, very literal minded people, we change it and we make it reflect reality. So it won't surprise you to know, any of you know anything of medieval English history, that we drop the bit about suppressing rapacity and iniquity. Uh, they were essential features of medieval English life and were clearly flourished by the king and everybody else. So we drop that. We keep justice in mercy and in truth. We keep ch peace to church and people, but we put in a series of clauses on law. There's a general clause about the laws of the confessor. And then in 1308, there is this most extraordinary clause that the king is required to swear to uphold the laws and liberties granted by, let's get this right, uh, sorry, uh, to uphold, I'm sorry, reading my wrong bit, to uphold the rightful laws and customs which the community of the realm shall have chosen a future perfect in both Latin and French. In other words, to bind him to rule according to the laws which will be chosen by a form of parliamentary assembly. And when, of course, he fails conspicuously to do that and he falls uh, 20 years later uh, in, in 1327, he is subject, and this again is quite extraordinary, he's not, you know, bumped off horribly, well he is bumped off horribly eventually, but first he's subject to a form of trial. 
Again, the ancestors of what's going on in America with Trump and whatever is all here in English history. Sets of art, I'm being very, very serious, sets of accusation, called the articles of accusation are levied against him, and they are derived directly from the breach of his coronation oath. And the next to the last article, the last article says he's simply incorrigible and must go, but the next to the last article picks up the most, as it were, noble of the coronation oaths, the, the, the oath to do justice in mercy and in truth, and explains he has defied it at every point and he's broken all the other articles of the oath. From, from this point onwards, in other words, we need to understand that underneath the magnificence of, the, of, of, of ceremony, the magnificence of consecration, the language of the church, the touching on of sacred vestments, the sacred crown of St. Edward's, the English coronation is a contract. And you are held to that contract, not by some notion of rebellion, but by the actual possibility of parliamentary deposition. And this is only the first such case. We go forward to the to the end of the we're, we're at the beginning we're at the beginning of the fourteenth century. You go to the end of the fourteenth century with Richard II, a remarkably similar phenomenon to Edward II. Again, uh, it's terrible. Remember, we we carefully suppress this. The only successful medieval kings are warriors. The medieval English monarchy is essentially a war monarchy. It's a supreme war monarchy of Europe. And again, there's a direct relationship between war, liberty, and representation. That is also true of 18th century England. All the greatest colonialists are the loudest proclaimers of liberty. And if you don't believe me, we can talk about this. Go and look at the statues in Guildhall. But, but, but that's another matter. Anyway, uh, Richard, Richard, and I'm afraid it's an awful prognostication for the reign of King Charles. Richard is, well, Ch King Charles has become uxorious, aesthetically sensitive, worries about art, um, um, loves music, poetry. God help us. Anyway, um, he's he's, um, he, is, he is dethroned um, with again the charge of saying, and listen to it, he thought the laws were in his own mouth, not by process of parliament. It's exactly the same phenomenon. But again, following the dethronement of Richard and the shift within the dynasty to his cousin, to, um, to, uh, uh, to Henry Plantagenet, to Henry, he's called Bolingbroke in Shakespeare, uh, the man who rules of Henry IV, what is very striking is that there's yet another, as there had been under, uh, 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 under Henry III, there's yet another ratcheting up of the consecration side of monarchy. The French monarchy had had the oil of Clovis going back to to the um, going back to uh, uh, the baptism of Clovis, the Carolingians, and all the rest of it. What you have with what you have with 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 uh, the English. The English had, as we can see, as, as I've already explained, um, with uh, 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 going back to Edgar. Uh, you have anointing going back to that point. But under Henry the Fourth, you invent your own legend. There is Beckett appearing to a dream uh, uh, to, uh, to, to Richard II, saying there's a holy oil blessed by the Virgin, but only a true king can have it. So, of course, you wicked old Richard II can't have it, but your true successor will have it, Henry IV and all the rest of it. So uh, from that point on, and again, the, 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 the French, the French ampulla, the thing from which you pour uh, the sacred oil, or rather, you actually look, it's very sticky, so you dig in, a, it's a bit like heavy mustard, you dig in a spoon. And, and pull it out. Elizabeth, Elizabeth I, uh, being ruthless in these matters, said it smelt ill. Anyway, um, the, the, when it was plastered on her, um, the, the French one is in the form of a dove, the spirit, the Holy Spirit descending. The English one was in the form of an eagle which is remade at the time of the, at the, time of the Civil War. Um, uh, so you get the creation uh, of, 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 of the Lancastrian monarchy, the triumph of the Lancastrian monarchy against the French under Henry V, the collapse of England into the Wars of the Roses uh, following the, the rule of, of Henry VI. And by the way, it's under Henry VI that for the first time the English monarchy uses the double-arched crown because of being King of England and France. 
the sense of an imperial dominion. It comes in then, and you can actually see it on the magnificent tomb of his father, Henry V, the conqueror of France in the Abbey, which is the thing that marks the moment at which the, the, the platforms built by, um, by, by Henry III run out and you've got to start building new burial places. So it's, it's, at, the, it's at the east end of that great, of that great horseshoe. And, and at the end of that process, the successor of the House of Tudor um, and the extraordinary groundbreaking, breaking everything really, reign of the man that I've spent most of my life studying, Henry VIII. Where does Henry come into this process? Henry is the only king who actually acknowledges that he broke his coronation oath. Henry knows with the break with Rome and whatever that he has broken his coronation oath. We even have his revision of it written afterwards for what I think is intended to be his second coronation. How does he get away with it? The answer is very straightforward. He only kicks the church. He doesn't kick the laity. Everything that he does against the church, everything that he does against his wives, everything that he does against St Thomas More, against St John Fisher, is done with the agreement of Parliament. And if we're to, as it were, see the reign of Henry VIII as a bloodstained one, then I'm afraid the entire community of the realm of England has got its hands in it up to the elbows. Everything that Henry does, because again, it's a strong king. Henry is brilliant, especially with the aid of Anne Boleyn and Thomas Cromwell at managing Parliament. But what you do at that point, ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me, is you create, for the first time in English government, you create a double centre. Up to this point, everything has been Westminster. The king is buried there, the king is crowned there, parliament meets there, the law courts meet there, the exchequer is there, the king lives there. Remember, government in the Middle Ages is only occasional. Government in the Middle Ages lasts as long as a university term at Oxford and Cambridge. So it's a, it's a minor incident in otherwise an agreeable time, hunting and doing all the rest of it. There are wonderful stories of ambassadors arriving at the beginning of June and saying, where's the king? And saying, <coughs> he'll probably be back in October. You know, the only thing that turns government permanent is the Reformation. At that point, Government becomes about enforcing opinions on the body, the Reformation or Counter-Reformation. It becomes about enforcing opinions on the body of the population. And under Henry, you get a bifurcation of government. This is the key thing. My great teacher at Cambridge, Geoffrey Elton, talked about a revolution in government. Um, he Remember, he's, he's a great German Jew, um, that, that extraordinary group of people that cut a knife through the academic establishments on both sides of the Atlantic. But unfortunately, he had absorbed the lessons of Max Weber. He believed in bureaucratic government replacing charismatic government. I was gently tried to explain to Henry, uh, to, so, sorry, to, um, to, to Geoffrey, uh, how did Thomas Cromwell explain to Henry VIII that he was redundant? Because, of course, you replace charismatic government with bureaucratic government. I suggested it was the day before he was executed by a deliberately inexperienced executioner. Um, um, but what the proper understanding, now let's get this right, there is a revolution in government under Henry. But it's not what Elton thought it was. What happens under Henry is you create two palaces and two centres of government. Parliament and the law courts remain in the Palace of Westminster. The king's part of the Palace of Westminster burns out in 1513 and is never rebuilt. And instead, the king takes over a palace whose name resonates through our history, Whitehall. And what the next palace along, um, uh, which had been originally the, the townhouse of the Archbishops of York, vastly expanded by the king's first minister, by Wolsey. And what he creates there is the new machinery of secretarial and conciliar government. You put the secretary and the privy council there. In other words, the instruments from which all our modern government descends. But these, ladies and gentlemen, are not the instruments of an absolute bureaucracy. Why is the council called privy? Because it's next to the king's lavatory. It is literally in the most private section of the palace. The king never sits in it, but it can only meet when he's in the building. 
The secretary actually is office is next door to the king's bedroom. And I can prove it because there are notes which say my carts can't get in because the king is sleeping late this morning and they're going to disturb him. So in other words, you create two centres of government. And I would argue you actually at this point, you create two different views of kingship. You create a view of kingship under the law, which is Westminster, competing against a view of kingship, which is the real actual will of the monarch. And the two are in potential conflict in this common arena of Parliament. And the conflict is, of course, exacerbated by religion. And the conflict culminates in the reign of Charles I of the House of Stuart. Because, again, it's really important we realise this. The House of Stuart succeeds to the English throne illegally. They had been excluded by Act of Parliament under Henry VIII and his will, and that Act of Parliament is deliberately lost by Elizabeth and her councillors, partly to facilitate union with Scotland, but also to facilitate the succession of the Stuarts. So the Stuarts are able to imagine they've succeeded against parliamentary writ by divine hereditary right, and it is catastrophic. And into the royal coronation oath, nobody quite knows how or where, under Charles I, this terrible word, prerogative, creeps. He will obey the law subject to the royal prerogative, a notion of a power which is above and beyond the ordinary law and above and beyond the power of Parliament, which, of course, with the clash over religion, leads to the Civil War, and the again, the repeat performance of Edward II, Richard II, and Charles I. Except with Charles, it's a genuine public trial and a genuine public execution, as opposed to being done to death in private. But you know what? It's exactly the same issue. The first line of the charges against Charles I are that having been made king to obey the law of the land, he then breaks it. In other words, it's direct invocation of the coronation oath when Bradshaw is presiding over his trial, which Charles, Charles refuses to recognise the, the, the quality of the, the, the right of the court to charge him. Bradshaw goes back to all these cases that I've been talking about and says, you are a conditional king. And of course, Finally, with the restoration uh, in, uh, uh, and, the, the, uh, and, and the glorious revolution of 1688-89, uh, with the, as it were, but again, just quickly, like time, 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 terrible thing called time. Why does it, with, with the execution of Charles I, and again, it is really important uh, we grasp this, there is the deliberate attempt at destroying the whole name of monarchy. You destroy all the royal regalia. You declare the, the, the very title of king to be unnecessary, burdensome and dangerous. You try to root the word king from the language. The destruction of the English royal regalia is infinitely greater than what the French did. Why does it come back? It comes back because you descend, as you always do with a revolution, straight into military dictatorship. And the only way you can control Cromwell, who has no limits on his power as Lord Protector, is by making him king. He can't do it because the army won't let him, so you bring back Charles Stuart instead. But then under Charles II, there is exactly the, re and James II, exactly the repeat of that tension between king as king as will and king under the law, until in 1689, we solve the problem permanently, at least until the reign of Charles III. That is to say, in 1689, the, that, the, 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 that clause relating to law, uh, which the king and uh, the queen, because William, uh, William and Mary are joint monarchs, they have to swear very simply the following. They have to swear that they will govern the people of the Kingdom of England and the dominions thereto belonging according to the statutes in Parliament agreed upon and all the laws and customs of the same. They swear to rule by Act of Parliament. And remember, it is 
the Bill of Rights is not a Bill of Rights of the citizen or the subject, it's a Bill of Rights of Parliament, that the, the body that is assumed to represent the entire nation is Parliament in 1689. And the again, uh, how very different from what is projected for the present coronation, where members of Parliament will be reduced to 20 for each house. In the in the coronation of 1689, the entire House of Commons, headed by the Speaker, is given a special gallery actually overlooking the choir. So directly over, in other words, the King has got to sort of look up and there are his real masters sitting there. And as Gilbert Burnett preaches the sermon in which he uh, contrasts the wonderful fortunate fate of the English now, we are not ruled by despotic power, sort of hint, hint, Louis XIV of France, nor an ungoverned multitude, hint, 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 what had happened in the Civil War, at which point, ladies and gentlemen, something that will not happen at the coronation of King Charles III, huge applause breaks out in the Abbey as that idea of moderate parliamentary government triumphing over despotism on the one hand and popular uh, insurrection on the other is spelled out. From that point onwards, that idea of republic is entrenched. And I would suggest the first time that it has been threatened seriously is in 2023. But we can explore that. Thank you.